welcome to our 26th episode of Two Tankers and a Cat. We are your host, I'm Charlie. And this is Russell. Well, we're going to do a quick announcement. Um, uh, I am back to streaming. Uh, I'm out of Facebook jail. Ah, so nice. Uh, again, most of our audience members are like, listen, we just want to hear this historical facts. We don't want to see you driving around in a little digital tank. <laughs> but those of you who do, come watch me. Try not to cuss and, I try, know. and, and try to be politically correct. Yeah. Um, let's uh, do our Patreon shout outs. Yeah, um, we've still got several at the M1 Abrams level that's given to us through Patreon. Uh, we've got Ben from Texas, uh, Kevin Chin, Kyler Montgomery, and Mark Drake at that level. Uh, at the M4 Sherman level, we've got Rick Smith. At the N3 Stewart level, we've got Andy Crow. And ODS Thero. Excellent. We have been working on getting some merchandise, and we just got uh, in the mail today some basically window stickers. Yeah. That says two tankers. It's got a big tank on it and everything, and uh, we're going to put pictures of it on Facebook. Um, we're going to send one up to Andrew Hill up there. Yeah, because he's the guy who wrote the uh, book and wants us to come up there. We're, yeah. we're planning a trip to go see Andrew. Uh, very fascinating man. We definitely didn't want to do an episode on him and what he's contributed to the tank community. Maybe we can start, you know, with some of these bigger Patreon, like the Abrams level, maybe sending send yeah, them one. That'd be pretty cool. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And maybe we can work out a deal where people can click on a link and get, you know, our mugs yeah, and T-shirts and sure, everything else. Sure. So we're working on that. And as soon as that comes, you know, viable, we're going to do that. In our Discord, yeah, we had a guy contact us and said that he would be our moderator and stuff like that. I think that's a really good uh, idea. Yeah, yeah. and um, we will get that up and running here pretty quick. Now, what's the giving levels? Because people keep saying, "Oh, I'm not going to give you thirty dollars or forty dollars." I'm like, "No, we're not asking for that." Yeah, the the M3 Stewart level, um, that's right at two dollars a month. Um, that's not a whole lot, but any little bit helps. Uh, we've got the M4 Sherman level that you can give about $5 a month. And we've also got the M1 Abrams level um, that we asked about $8 a month for it. Or I believe that you can give about any amount a month that you want to. I mean, they can get on there and, and give whatever if, they want. And if you don't know Patreon, we still take PayPal. Oh, yes, yes. And also I did want to mention there are links now to our Patreon site on our on our actual webpage at www dot two tankers and cat dot com so all the links are on there now to to donate through paypal and patreon nice and our facebook leads to our uh dot com right yes uh -huh. excellent excellent well let's just jump right into it our first key point today we are going to be talking about the ford three ton tank and basically it's a two-man tank is one of your favorites yeah. the little little tanks are what we call tankettes and people are like, oh, wait a minute, there's no, that's an early not the definition of a tank. I, we know, yes, okay, yes. we know, but we're going to call it, if it's a two-man tank, we're going to call it a tank head. Sure. So uh, please understand it's a layman's term. But it, uh, we're going to cover the uh, Ford 3-ton uh, tank, and then I think it's time, this is episode 26, we need to kick around the future of tankettes. Uh, you know, uh, as drone tanks. And sure, we're going to talk about sure. some drone tanks. Now, something you don't know, I forgot to tell Russell this, and this is new to Russell. Um, I've been researching uh, the drone tanks that, and I don't want to get all the polit I'm trying to be politically <laughs> correct here. Russia had deployed one of their drone tanks in actual combat in Syria. And uh, we're going to talk about that, but let's let's jump in on uh, this Ford three ton. Now, this is a World War One tank. R Russ, give us a little bit about it. Yeah, during World War One, American forces in France used either French light tanks or British heavy tanks. In 1918, Ford copied the design of the French Renault FT-17 to create an American two-man tank, or known as the Ford three ton tank. Okay, so the actual Ford, you know, <laughs> the original guy, yeah. like, hey, wait a minute, uh, I think we need to make a tank. <laughs> uh, 
although it was called a tank, it was really a machine gun carrier. Yeah, but like we said, I mean, yes, that's an official thing. That's why people say, well, that's not really a tank yet. And I'm like, please understand, we're going to use the layman terms, and we're going to call it, yes, the proper, it was a machine gun carrier, but we're going to call it a three-ton tank yet. Tank yet. The Ford three-ton tank was the smallest and least expensive tank built in the United States. It had two Model T Ford engines that together produced 45 horsepower. So it only had 45 horsepower? That's incredible. (laughs) And you think about some of the other ones we've talked about. Uh, Yeah. That's incredible. Well, and they said it was uh, the smallest and least expensive. So Ford was like, we got to kick out, you know, well, production line. Sure. You know, and, and that's what Americans are known for. You know, we kick out the Shermans and everything else, production line. You know, people compliment German engineering. And, and, you know, if you look at some of the cars that are made by the Germans, they make some beautiful cars. Oh, yeah. And, and they're very well designed. And Americans are used to making 50,000 of them and shipping them over. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> kind of like we did the Shermans. <laughs> So they make these little uh, t- tankettes. So tell us a little bit more. Yeah, both the driver and the gunner sat at the front of the tank. Uh, the driver controlled the steering by changing the gear ratio in each engine. The gunner had a 0.3-inch machine gun, that which was placed in a limited traverse mount. Now, we're going to have pictures uh, of these, uh, this tank, and you're going to look at it. They're sitting side by side like you would be in a passenger car. Wow. And it sits low to the ground. And so one guy's controlling both engines, getting them idled the same and turn and twist and everything like that. And the other guy's sitting there with this machine gun and rolling down the road. And when you see the picture, the Renault, uh, you know, uh, FT-17, it's a small tank. Sure, We've been... We've handled it and yeah, seen the actual yeah. one that was used in combat. In fact, it had cannon damage to yeah. it. And then you just look at the picture of this little thing, and it's littler <laughs> than that. A prototype of the Ford three-ton tank was sent to France and was tested and approved before the armistice. Only 15 three-ton tanks were built, although 15,015 were originally ordered. Okay, so... Like I said, so the driver and the commander sit next to each other like a sports car. <laughs> okay. Russ, I know there was very little information on this tank, and we had to dig up some research on this. But tell us more and touch back on some of the stuff you've already, or the info you've already said. Since Renault, a car builder, designed and mass-produced the famous FT back in the United States, Ford was obviously pressed to submit its own design. This was to be the three-ton tank. Even smaller than the M1917, this model was design focused with mass production in mind. It was very simple, lighter, and more stable, sharing the same thin, long-running track lane arrangement, but with a wider hull, large enough for a driver and seated commander gunner side by side. Basically, Ford, you know, is getting static. They're like, hey, Ronald's a... Yeah. You know, car builder, and he's kicking out thousands of these tanks, and you're not doing anything. Sure. And Ford's like, if I make it cheap and sell it at a good price, I'm going to sell thousands. And like they said, they were like an order for 15,000. 15,000 of them. That's quite a few. It is. The latter used a whole bow 30 caliber or 7.62 millimeter Browning machine gun. Just behind were located the power pack, fuel, and ammo. The commander relied on a rotating mushroom-type cupola for vision, but the lack of a true armed 360-degree traverse turret was an obvious problem. There was no compartment separation, so the cramped interior rapidly grew smelly, hot, and extremely noisy during operations. It was propelled by a twin Ford T engine, giving a 90-horsepower total, mated to a Ford planetary gearbox. Estimated top speed was 8 miles per hour, or around 12 kilometers per hour. Although the Army initially ordered 15,000 of them, only 15 were delivered, and two reached France before the mass-produced, more satisfying M1917 were made available. 
Eventually, the program was canceled with the armistice, just as Ford was gearing up for the projected delivery of 100 tanks per day. There's American ingenuity. They're like, okay, yeah, yeah, we're going to, you want 15,000? We can change our line and we'll kick out a hundred of these tanks a day hundred a day, and they can ship them yeah. on top of each sure, other. Sure. But again, not air conditioned, uh, not very much ventilation. The engine's right behind you. It's hot. I, I'm telling yeah. you, me and you side by oh, side wow. in a car with oh, no air conditioning. Man. Oh Lord. Yeah. Especially getting shot at. I wouldn't want to go very far in something like that. No. So, wow, 100 100 tanks a day and easy to make. Typical American standards. Uh, Russ, give us some stats. Yeah, um, the tank weighed, like we talked about, three tons. It had a length of about 14 foot or 4.3 meters. It was six foot wide or 1.8 meters wide, and it was about six foot tall. It had a crew of two. It had a driver and a gunner. Its main armament was the 30 caliber or 7.62 millimeter Browning machine gun, and it had no secondary armament at all. Well, you know, we're talking about what six foot tall. Yeah, uh, that means there wouldn't I, have been I, much room for I, anything else. Yeah, I'm I'm taller than that. Yeah, I could be looking over the top of the tank, and they're like, "Okay, sit down," and I'm like, <laughs> "What do you want us to do? Well, I want you to charge that trench." Oh. Uh, no. Wow. <laughs> what kind of engine did it have? Yeah, it had two Ford Model T engines. Kicked out about 45 horsepower or 34 kilowatts. Had a power to weight ratio of about 10.4 horsepower per ton. Had an operational range of 55 kilometers or about 34 miles. And well, it's, What kind of speed are we talking yeah, about? Yeah, yeah. Its speed was about 12.8 kilometers per hour or 8 miles per hour. 8 miles an hour. Not very fast. So basically, Some humans can probably walk faster. Than that, so you're you're sitting down, and you're sitting there trying to keep both engines going at the same time, and you're heading towards enemy trench lines, and they're like, you know what, this is actually a really good tank. Uh, yeah, you know, it's going to let us get up right next to bunkers, machine gun nests, and stuff like that. Because during World War One, machine guns were just devastating yeah, people yeah so if they could drive anything close and the machine gun them uh, it, it was a good idea sure wow okay russ they sent some to france uh what was the french army's thoughts on the ford the french army evaluated the ford three-ton tank and thought it inferior to the native renault ft which huh? i'm sure they probably would i mean mm-hmm. after after what they'd put into their renault however the three-ton tank was seen to have potential as a cheap, light, all-terrain artillery tractor, especially for batteries of the Canon D75 Model A 1897. 1,500 three-ton tanks were ordered from Ford. Basically, the French are saying, hey, our Renault's a better tank, but we could use this for an all-terrain artillery tractor. So we're going to let it carry, you know, our 75 uh, Canon. And, you know, and basically be able to machine gun and sure, defend itself. Sure. Okay. So I, 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 so both sides thought the tank was a good idea, but, but why? There were ambitious plans to use the vehicle as a machine gun and ammunition carrier, a cargo carrier, a tractor, and a self-propelled howitzer. It was powered by two Model T Ford engines each with its own electric starter and three-speed transmission. I had two forward and one reverse speeds. The engines together produced 45 horsepower. It is interesting to speculate the course of armored vehicle development in the U.S. had this little terrier not been put down. Okay, so we were sitting in the France, you know, French, and they had uh, three transmission, two forward, one reverse. If it's going to be in France, shouldn't it have three in reverse and one in four? Oh, oh no. Man. I did it oh, again. Wow. Yeah, oh. Our French followers are just. Oh. It, that's horrible. I, I, I apologize. <laughs> that wasn't politically correct. The French are a brave and proud people, yes. and at no point were we calling them. You know, we just uh, thought it would be funny. It's kind of an <laughs> ongoing joke that they were faster in reverse. Oh. But no, they, were, they have a long 
tradition of military history. Yes, yes. Um, we keep hitting on the two engines, the T's, but the key on that last bit of information is that it had an electric start. Uh, even the Renault had one of those old crank starters. The crank starters, yeah. And if your car, if your tank yeah, stops, sure. you don't want to get out in the middle of gunfire and sit there and crank on it. I wouldn't. And uh, and that it had uh, a three speed transmission, you know. So Ford is doing his transmission stuff and yeah. making the electric starts. So they're looking at it, it eventually changing the machine gun out for a little howitzer. Yeah. So they can drop shells into it and, and use it for that and, and to haul ammo and everything else. So okay, it's it's a pretty good vehicle then. The three ton tank, uh, we. There wasn't a lot of information on it, but it was good information. And like I said, this brings up a good question. In today's, you know, we, we talked about the three ton and how it got put down and everything. But you're talking about two countries that fought in that big World War One, and they're saying smaller armed with not a lot of people can do a lot of damage. And, and that stayed in the back of a lot of developers' minds. So we're going to talk about the drones. Now, I know Russ has, you've seen some of our drone. If you're a Patreon follower, we have uh, ex- exclusive content for you. And basically, we have do- we do drone footage of tanks and stuff like that and other uh, fo- footage that you can get. Let's just talk about some of these drones. And, you know, uh, this isn't scripted. We're just yeah, going off yeah. what we're talking about. And we want to get our listeners' thoughts on this, too. This is uncharted territory. Let's just talk about drones. What do you think about the drones? I, I just think it's going to be incredible, to be honest with you. I mean, if they can go out and do some scouting with a drone tank, I, I mean, it's just incredible what what – the opportunities will be there for a technology like that. Uh, I look at our new uh, world uh, aircraft drones yeah. that are doing military operations, but the pilot is in Houston, Texas, yeah. in an air-conditioned yeah. video. They don't, they don't even have to leave the country uh, no. to operate these. Yeah, they, they fl- leave their forward operating base there sure and the mechanics put in the yeah. film and loaded it with ammo and everything else and they wheel it out to the track yeah and then it it's all the pilot and the pilots using satellite links and everything and people are like well you're getting into push button war well that that's technology you're right we're to that point in technology that i think that's what's going to be happening you know people say well you can't see person eye to eye and that makes war not personal. I'm yeah, like impersonal. I- yeah, impersonal. But. And I'm like, when was war ever personal yeah, or exactly. impersonal? Exactly. You know? And, and people say, well, w- w- what's the main goal? Well, it's to protect your people. People don't understand that if you get a specialized operator, and I hate using the term soldiers because these guys have went above and beyond the training that soldiers get. We're talking about professional operators. These are guys that are trained in scuba and air and parachutes and all these different tactics. Yeah. And they're saying, Hey, we got to get danger close. Well, can't you get us something that goes out there? Well, instead of sending an aircraft, that's a billion dollars to drop, Mm -hmm. you know, a one little missile, to hit a you know one little uh, area, why not use these little drones? Yeah. Um. Did you see the? I uh, you know if you guys heard about this that even some of the Iranians are using drones to uh, go out and uh, I don't want to say harass. I don't. I don't want to get into the politics of that. But the Iranians are using drones now uh, on these oil uh, barge ships and stuff like that. Have you heard anything about this? No, not really. Yeah, no, they've been using drones with uh, bombs to try and blow up these oil. Oh, uh, okay. Well, they're actually ships. These oil. Huh. What do you call them? Oil tankers. Yeah, oil yeah, tankers. Yeah. But they've been going out, connecting magnetically to the side of these tanks, and they explode. Wow. Blow holes no, in. I them. had not heard about that yet. But wow. 
I mean, there's just so many different ways they could use a drone like that as a weapon, probably. But yeah, uh, the Iranians are using these drones because they're cheap and they're easy to build and you can get danger close. I know that our military has been using them for years, but we usually use it for surveillance. Yeah. Like our ground teams and stuff like that. Sure. The Americans are working on uh, what I wanted to talk about. The second point uh, is these drones. But the the Americans has got the Gladiator Tactical Unmanned Ground Vehicle. Now, let me go say this again. It's called the Gladiator, and it's a tactical unmanned ground vehicle. So you're going to hear T-U-G-V. The Gladiator program is a U.S. Marines Corps initiative based on the Joint Army-Marine Corps Tactical Unmanned Vehicle, TUVs. Uh, The ordinance uh, originated by the Infantry School, uh, dated uh, November 4th of 1993. Yeah. Uh, They validated the need for a tactical unmanned ground vehicle system, and the Army approved this program. In August of 1995, and the Marine Corps, and by the Marine Corps, in uh, 1996, existing unmanned uh, vehicles contained several deficiencies, which the Army and both the Marine Corps developed and re-evalu- reevaluated design aspects. Uh, the developments of the Gladiator allowed it to support dismounted in- infantry and aid in scouts, surveillance, direct engagement, and obstacle breaching missions. So that's what we're talking about. You get these specialized operators from the Army and the Marine Corps, and they're like, listen, we need, you know, support for, you know, like dismounted infantry. We need it in for scout and surveillance, even in direct engagement and uh, obstacle breaching missions. I hate to bring this up, but like in Afghanistan, but we also had Japan, you know, in the caves and yeah, stuff. Yeah. W- w- you send in this gladiator that's a mini tank. And you operate it like you do your drone on like an iPad. Sure, sure. And it drives in there. It's armor plated and it's got machine guns and rockets and gas, you know, tear gas. Yeah. And and you can go in there and see what's in there. And and if you see 60 guys with AK-47s and, you know, suicide vests, you're not sending your operators into a, a trap. So there's a need for drones. And like I was saying, people don't understand well, what's this so important about these operators or these, and I hate using the term special forces, but we'll go ahead and say special yeah, force, sure. uh, special yeah. force operator. These are guys that were soldiers and they had more advanced training. These soldiers, they have to get educators. They have to provide them with books, technical manuals, training, weapons, food, medical supplies. There is tons of money that goes into training a proper warrior or a op- proper operator. And this is everywhere in the world. Sure I, I don't care if you're British or uh, from Brazil. Every country usually has some kind of special operations, you know, operators. Even our police force. We, we have SWAT teams. You know, they, these are guys that get specialized weapons and specialized training and the stuff that we don't get in the academy. Tell us a little bit more about the Gladiator, Russ. The Gladiator TUGV is a robust, compact, unmanned, teleoperated, multi-purpose ground reconnaissance, surveillance, and target acquisition vehicle system possessing a scouting and direct engagement capability. It provides the armed forces with remote reconnaissance, surveillance, and target acquisition, nuclear, biological, and chemical reconnaissance, obstacle breaching, and direct fire capability to neutralize threats and reduce risk to the warfighter. Or operator. Or the operator, yeah. Yep. After refitting it for cargo carrying and autonomous operations over terrain and roads, it also provides small unit resupply features. The TUGV system can be utilized by infantry battalions and combat engineer companies. It's small enough to be strategically, operationally, and tactically deployable worldwide for ground aircraft and sea transport missions what we're saying you know we got technical there basically the gladiator is a drone that we can fly over let's say a special forces unit or even an infantry unit that's running low on 
food sure. or ammunition sure. or medical supplies or they need a specialized medical supply, mm-hmm. they can put it in this gladiator yeah. that's armed to the teeth yeah. and they can drop it. And They can it, kick this thing out of the back of a C-130 and, and airplane and, and drop it from where it needs to be dropped. Altitudes and, you can't see well, sure. in the middle of the night and it lands, it sees perfectly in night, it has heat signatures, and if you're a bad guy... It, it'll open fire on you and yeah. terminate with extreme prejudice. Yes, yes. You know, well, it would not even extreme prejudice. <laughs> it just like, terminates you because that's what it's programmed yeah. to yeah. do. It, the Gladiator, on paper, has been working pretty well, and uh, it went operational, what, 2015? We can talk about where, like we were talking about the Ford 3-ton being a little tankhead. Mm-hmm. What was its job? They were going to put two guys in there and they were going to load it with ammo, food, uh, being a carrier. Yeah, yeah. And they were going to drive out to places where they needed to refit people or give ammo or something like that. From that with a two man thing and being light, now they have no man. Yeah. And they can fly it, it's land it, incredible. and it can drive through enemy territory yeah. and get to people where they're you know, down and out. Just an incredible innovation, if you ask me. I mean, it's just like we talked about, there's a lot of people that's probably going to be against it. Oh, yeah. Because of the impersonal part of it, but you know. Uh, yeah. And, and it's all computer. Sure. I, but well, what happens, though, when it breaks down and all it is is just the computer part of it? And, and we're going to. And you're not putting anybody else at risk uh, that's inside the thing to. Right. And. and I want our audience to comment on this and give us your st- stories. Email us, send us messages on Facebook, or just comment. Or if you're we, out there and actually have any experience with these the, the drones, thing, these, you can actually talk about. You know, we, that's I, when we need to get on Discord and yeah. talk about somebody who's actually dealt yes, this stuff. Yeah. We're just researching this stuff, and the only reason I got interested, I have a friend in Syria. And he's like, you won't believe what the Russians have. And I'm like, well, what are you talking about? And he sent me pictures that I'm not opposed to have and, and of this thing in actual deployment. Yeah. And I was like, oh, wow. <laughs> uh, so I started checking out some of our stuff. We have another. Uh, the Gladiator's a small uh, tracked thing. But we have a bigger one called the Black Knight. Tell us a little bit about the Black Knight. The design of the Black Knight armed robotic demonstrator was started in 2005 and it was unveiled in 2006 at the Association of the United States Army in Washington, D.C. This unmanned ground vehicle is very similar to a light tank armed with a turret-mounted 30mm gun and a 7.62mm coaxial machine gun. The vehicle is fitted with a 300 horsepower Caterpillar Corporation diesel engine. So this thing, I've seen it. It looks kind of like a Bradley, and it's got a 30 millimeter auto cannon, and, and it's armored, and it's also got you know the 7.62, I guess the what 30 caliber uh, on it if you're using the American yeah. side. Yeah. Why we never went to millimeters? I don't know. We, I don't know. This proves how dumb our country I, can be sometimes. <laughs> like if I can't say the names I of people know. and I can't say the <laughs> city's name or the country's right. No wonder they didn't expect me to learn <laughs> millimeters and centimeters. But this thing's fitted with a 300-horse Caterpillar Corporation. And we're going to put some pictures of these up. Promise me we'll do that on yes, Facebook. Yes, yes. So if you get a chance, go over there. We're going, to have, we're going to have some pictures of the Black Knight, and we'll have the Gladiator. Give us some more information. I know there were some problems with it in the early 2000s, but now they're really looking at the Black Knight. They might change the name of it by the time they get there. But this is an actual tank yes. with a 30 millimeter auto cannon that's going to be deployed in combat. In January 2006, Carnegie Mellon's National Robotics Engineering Center received a contract from BAE Systems to design and add the sensors, hardware, and computing elements for full autonomous navigation capability. In the late summer of 2006, the ARI Autonomy System was successfully tested during a week-long field trial in Somerset, Pennsylvania. When they talk about it was successfully tested, they were firing the cannons, they were firing the machine guns, they were locating enemies. It was going in and out of forest, deep terrain, regular roads, urban terrain, and it it worked. There was a few kinks, 
but they're working these out. Go ahead and... Yeah, the Black Knight unmanned combat vehicle can be controlled from the commander station of a Bradley, which was demonstrated at the Association of the U.S. Army's 2006 Winter Symposium and Exhibition. Its turret is equipped with operative components from the Bradley Combat Systems Program, illustrating the synergy between the current force and the future force. Gun and turret position, as well as information from the commander's independent viewer and the improved Bradley acquisition system, can be seen on a screen in the Bradley commander's crew station. As soldiers dismount, they take a dismounted control device along and continue to operate the Black Knight, receiving information on the single screen on the DCD. What we're talking about is that the Bradley holds six guys, and each one of these guys can have one of these ta- dismounted tactical t- controls. And, and, and I hate to bring this up, again, our video game World Tanks has that blitz where you can play on iPad. So now they've got real tanks that they're controlling with their fingers and firing and everything like that. So these guys dismount having the Bradley back there in safety and these other six tanks move up. If they run into combat, they handle that. And when you talk about this Black Knight, it's eventually going to be fitted like the Bradley is with the anti-tank missiles. Now you're talking about 30 millimeter autocannon, 30 caliber machine gun, and it's going to be firing anti-tanks. When it's all out of ammo, they just hit return and it comes back to a safe spot where the Bradley is and they reload it and send it back out again. Yeah. And they're they're just sitting there, you know, in a forward position. You know, these operators, mm-hmm. they're highly trained. Now they're, you know, highly trained in electronics. And they're taking armor to the front of the fight. And if the enemy shoots, you know, disables these and knocks them out, nobody dies. Nobody dies. Uh, on, on your side. Uh, tell us a little bit more. An unmanned... Ground combat vehicle offers several advantages on modern battlefields as unmanned consorts to ground forces. They are capable of both day and night operation for missions that are too risky for manned ground vehicles, including forward scouting, RSTA, or Reconnaissance, Surveillance, and Target Acquisition, also intelligence gathering, and investigating hazardous areas. And when they talk about hazardous areas... Chemical weapons. Sure. Uh, nuclear weapons. Uh, yes. uh, depots that are leaking stuff that they shouldn't. And this might be yeah. just oil wells. Sure. You know, flaming oil wells and stuff like that. And they're like, what's hiding behind that black smoke? Now with these electronic sensors and radar and mm-hmm. stuff, they don't need to visual. They can go in and yeah. drive right through it and drive see it. Because it. Yeah. it doesn't matter if it's night, dark, yeah. smoky, or anything. This thing sees everything. And it's reporting back to the guy. And you're not putting a human being in, in risk. At risk. They also enable operators to acquire situational data from unmanned forward positions and verify mission plans by using map data to confirm the terrain. If required... They can engage enemy assets from a remote position of safety. Like we were saying, this vehicle, uh, and what they're calling a UGCV, is unmanned ground or unmanned ground combat vehicle. This is basically an unmounted Bradley with tons of tech on it, missiles, auto cannons, machine guns, and they're driving out, and yeah. they can kill tanks. Well, anything. Pretty much. And they can find anything. You can't use camouflage against something that can heat sense and yeah. electronic sense. And when, especially when you have an actual operator that's visually looking through cameras at your stuff. Well, and like I said, I want to get the audience involved in this. And and I'm not going to talk about how I know about certain things and who I talk to and stuff because I don't want to get political. Let's just flat out talk about it. Tell us about the Russian tank drone. The results are in on the Russian Euron 9 combat drone and its baptism of fire, and it isn't good. Uh, Euron 9, bristling with guns and missiles, may look impressive, but it has troubles with the fundamentals, not only of armored warfare, but warfare by remote control. The remote control combat vehicle lost contact with ground control stations, suffered from an unreliable gun and suspension system, and cannot target enemies while on the move. So what we're talking about is uh, there are some Russian forces operating in Syria right now. I mean, and I don't want to get in the politics of this, people. We're not talking about this. We're trying to stay on focus. And in Syria, they had this Iran uh, 9 combat drone. And this is, as far as I know, this is the first 
real combat situation where it's getting shot at, RPGs are getting shot at, you know, it's being targeted and stuff. And they're starting to, they basically took all the data and went back in and it's having serious problems. But why don't you tell us a little bit about the Euron uh, 9? Yeah, the Euron 9 was introduced in 2016 and it's designed as an unmanned fire support vehicle for the Russian ground forces. The UGV is 16.7 feet long and weighs approximately 10 tons. Uh, the Iran 9 packs some serious firepower with one 30 millimeter 2A72 automatic cannon and four 9M120-1 Ataka anti-tank guided missiles. That is some serious firepower. The result is a vehicle that is theoretically deadly to troops on foot, light armored vehicles, and even main battle tanks. What we're talking about like put some anti-tank weapons on there a 30 millimeter cannon and they're like okay we're going to take this out there and we're going to use it on paper like they're saying theoretically ground troops can't do anything they're sitting there shooting machine guns at it it's bouncing off yeah bouncing right off of it and and it's firing its machine gun back at them with no armor yeah. Uh, your light armored vehicles like Humvees or trucks or you know any homemade you know resistant you know armored vehicle that they bring up it's blowing holes with the 30 millimeter and if they bring in their big tanks you know their main battle tanks their anti-tank guns or or rockets or missiles are knocking them out sure killing them so if you can take out a bunch of infantry with a 30 cal and then take out their armored vehicles with the 30 millimeter and then take out four metal main battle tanks You've done a lot You're of right. damage. You're right. Well, tell us about the reality. The reality is that the Euron 9 is pretty much a hot mess. <laughs> One of the most serious problems, of which there are many, is the vehicle is on a short tether. On average, capable of straying only about 1,000 to 1,600 feet from its manned control station. Euron 9 lost contact with the control station 19 times, 17 times for a minute or less, and at least in one case, up to one and a half hours. The problem was exacerbated in urban fighting centers with buildings blocking the radio signal. Oh. So they're getting out there and they're like, okay, we at max, we can be 1,600. And then when we're inside the city and we're back and we're... I mean, we've had back. those same problems with law enforcement on our radios we use. Uh, that's being true. around tall buildings. And- you know, that is true. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you that. Because we've been inside concrete buildings and, and just certain parts that your your radio yeah. can't get out. Yeah. And you, you might be four blocks away from the police station and they can't hear you. Sure. So these vehicles are, you know, when they don't have a signal, they shut down. They shut down. And one of them, the fire fight was so heavy that it took them an hour and a half to get close enough to kick it back on. The remote fire control system is also a problem. With the 2A72 experiencing a lag before firing six times and an outright failure once. Another problem with the Euron is that the armament, optics, and sensors aren't stabilized for firing on the move, requiring the vehicle to stop first. So they want to, they see, you know, people running in the street shooting at it. They have to stop it, wait for the lag to fix. Yeah. Sounds like oh, more wor- wow. our video game I world know, tanks because sometimes we lag out and. <laughs> And, and people that play any video game will Gosh. talk about the hate of lag. So they've got their tank out there, and they're like, go ahead and fire. They see the tank point at them. It's waiting to get its order to fire. By that time, they've already moved. They fired, and it's empty. They're suffering from lag. Uh, they're losing radio signal. Your online's combat experience in Syria revealed serious problems with the system. That having been said, the UGV was not a vital part of the fighting, and the whole point of sending the systems to a combat zone was to expose flaws that might not show up in peacetime. Your on 9 might be a failure, but the concept itself is promising. If Russia's defense industry can fix the problems, Moscow could have a dependable, lethal robot on its hands and a real threat to NATO forces. And, and I don't want to get into the politics of this. You know, we did say that it'd be a, a threat to NATO forces. Hopefully... Russia and, and we'll never have a problem with the West, but could the future hold in something sad, you know, something happens, you know, whatever. Yeah. They get this thing running the way it should. I'm sure they've probably made some pretty good. You got to remember 
they just now to brought it. this out of Syria yeah. and they're like, this is a great thing, but here's where we're having problems in. We need to work on our optics. We need to work on our lag. We need to work on that. They have all their bugs. This was in live fire. They shot at it. Yeah. I, I know that they shot at oh, it. Oh, I'm sure. And this was used in combat. You know, I, I guess the, what I'm saying is once they work these bugs out, this is going to be a deadly vehicle. And it goes back to tankettes. You know, I, I agree. these little bitty tanks uh-huh. are able to kill main battle tanks. Why would you build main battle tanks when you can build these yeah. Yeah. that are smaller, easier to, you know, mm-hmm. equip? You, Toss them out the back of an airplane and get you, them to where they need to go. Yeah. yeah. You could drop these out in the middle of nowhere yeah. and have armored forces. But what I'm saying, and people aren't, I'm, I'm hoping our audience is following us. You get this uh, uh, ground force vehicle, um, like our Black Knight or the Euron 9. You drop that, that's your main armor. Yeah. But you got the gladiators that are smaller that are running around handling individual troops and individual teams. And then you put the drones that we have currently that are amazing sure. yeah, up in the sky. Yeah. Where You're, they can get behind the lines and then, yeah. Or, or even break through the lines. Yeah. You, you don't have any soldiers on the front line anymore. No. Uh-uh. All you've got is mechanics yeah. and, and technical guys and You'll engineers. Have a technology war. That's what it comes down to. So is that what we're headed to? You know, that's why we're reaching out to our listeners and saying, I truly what, think what's that's your the direction we probably are. You know, I hope not. I, I agree. I, I hope we don't ever have another war and I everything's know. peaceful and everything like that. But what what does history yeah, teach I us? Know. You're right. You know, these things are being built to work in nuclear areas, yeah. which is horribly scary. And you know that these things can carry nukes in itself. Well, sure, sure. And they'll be able yeah. to eventually carry any armament that's available today, I would imagine. Yeah, and, and it's totally immune to chemical weapons, biological mm. weapons, n- nuclear weapons. They're hard case, so like e- even your uh, EMP, electric yeah. magnetic uh, pulse, wouldn't affect these things. And they probably have Google Earth, you know, <laughs> showing where the highways and bridges and Man. rivers and everything else. It's just, you know, with satellites and oh, everything. It's incredible. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, where are we headed? We would love to get your input. Please, yes. you know, message us and send us some emails. We will try to answer every single one of them. And we appreciate it. What a great episode. Now, I know we ran a little long, but why don't we go ahead and do the closing? Yeah. Um, as always, uh, kind of touch on how you can contact us. Uh, email is two tankers and cat at gmail.com. Um, you can get links to all of the ways you can contact us on our website at www.twotankersandcat.com. You can also contact us through our Facebook page at www.facebook.com backslash two tankers and cat podcast. The easiest way there is just to search for two tankers and cat podcast on Facebook and that'll take you to our page. I am still amazed that I can do my Google home and say, Hey Google, the uh, play two tankers and a cat podcast. Yeah, I know. <laughs> and they'll play the latest we're, we're, episode. We're, we are out there everywhere. Yeah. folks. And, and thank you for your yes, support. Exactly. Uh, we are sorry that we, we made you think, you know, about the future of these wars and the future of these tanks. But, uh, like you said, we gave you our, uh, ways of contact us. Please do. We'd want yes, to hear what you exactly. think. Exactly. But uh, until next time, this is Charlie. And this is Russell. Happy tanking and have a great week.